Hello, I'm Barbara Armentrout, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this second part of our AMS Roadmap for Association Executives hosted by Aplusify. Last week, we explored finding the right AMS for your association. So today we go to the next logical step, implementation. Today's session is kickstarting your AMS, the implementation journey. And we're in the capable hands of a dynamic pair from Delcor Technology Solutions, Gretchen Steenstra and Kathleen McQuilkin. Gretchen is a strategic consultant on technology management with Delcor, where she works with association staffers to empower them to use systems to their full potential. She's sometimes labeled as interim CIO, but always fully invested in making the project successful for the association client. She's also a founding leader of Association Women Technology Champions. Kathleen McQuilkin is Delcor's Director of Technology Management Consulting, where she is regularly hands-on with implementation project management and provides support for major systems implementations and upgrades. She also does contract review and negotiations. Kathleen, both Kathleen and Gretchen are members of PMI and are PMI certified PMPs. Both Gretchen and Kathleen also are active members of ASAE and they have backgrounds serving on staff at associations. This helps them understand what it's like to sit at your desk during this arduous process. As Gretchen and Kathleen swirl us through a lot of information over the next 40 or so minutes, we'll pull questions from the chat screens when they fit into the flow. The rest will save for the final segment when we invite participants to toss questions at our expert panel. We'll do our best to wrap up by minute 60 so you can join your next Zoom meeting. Now we'll get started as we switch up our screens Please join me in welcoming Gretchen Steenstra and Kathleen McQuilkin. I'm going to share my screen to get to our presentation. I All think right. that's an excellent idea. Woohoo! There we go. <laughs> that's great. So you all get to see me live, Kathleen, and Gretchen is joining us uh, from her vacation. Um, and she is going to be joining us just via telephone. So we can talk about going photo. above and beyond. Yes, exactly. That's who Gretchen is. <laughs> well, the, uh, Barbara asked me to do this first. And then the only week that would work was this week. So, you know, I'd honor my obligation and I really appreciate you inviting us to this series. Um, as you said, Kathleen and I spend a lot of time in this space. And so what we want to talk about today is just keeping the implementation going. But this also would work if you were implementing not only an AMS, but if any new system in your organization or a major upgrade, these are just some of the, the repeatable steps that you can employ to help smooth out your projects. And I imagine a lot of this would help with people who are using their LMS to do virtual events now too. Oh yeah, yes. So anything, anything that you're installing a system that takes more than 30 days, this is a, a, just a really good framework to follow. So Moira kind of set everybody up with how to select a system and pick the best vendor for you. We're gonna talk about the implementation starts with discovery, then you set up your system, you roll through tr testing, a lot of testing, more training, and then you launch. And then Rebecca A. Church will talk about life after launch because that's really when you start to get your hands on the system. Okay, so, all righty. All right, so the first thing that you need to figure out is your team readiness, the size of your team and their tech um, comfort is really important to measure. And so this is something where it's an exercise you should do with yourself to say, where, is, where are people on this spectrum of really comfortable with technology, adapt really quickly or tentative learners they want to try, but they just don't have the experience. And it's the same thing with your staff size. Are you a large staff with lots of people available on the team to support this project? Or do you have a small staff where people are going to have to double team their work and this project at the same time? So it's really important to just understand where you are in the process. And it's also interesting to have this conversation with your vendor. Now, hopefully their tech savvy is in that top right corner, really high but they also could be a small staff vendor. And so that's the other pairing you'll have to do when you're looking at your schedule and resources. Part of this upfront you know, assessment as you're getting ready for a project is thinking about what is your role 
and responsibility for the project. Um, you know, we're recognizing that we've got a variety of size organizations, but small staff organizations that are doing a significant amount of responsibilities. Everyone's wearing their 12 different hats. So you may have different executives involved in the project, as well as asking uh, the variety of staff to add one more hat on, you know, whether they're uh, a project coordinator or things like that, um, they may have a role for this project. So thinking about what roles they have, um, what roles you have, as well as what responsibility uh, you or your team members will have for the project. So now we're on the topics that we're gonna cover here. Gretchen? Gretchen is muted. So I will just talk about this. You know, this is a, probably information you saw when you're looking at the um, webinar, but we're covering four key fit, uh, pieces here as part of the webinar. One is kind of a PM 101. Um, some of the basics that are relevant for a project we're not going to go through the whole PMP, you know, all the tools in your toolbox as a project manager, but some basic components. And then we want to talk about finding your voice, your organization's voice as you start an implementation project, um, making the change work for you throughout the implementation. And then, of course, a key point is going to be pacing yourself. And so we're going to talk about that. Click to the next slide. And this is the PM 101. Gretchen is still muted, so I'm going to keep talking. Um, Barbara, I don't know if we can unmute Gretchen. But regardless, so <laughs> this is a oh, slide. Here I am. About, okay. Oh, there you go. Thank you. There you go. It just says the host must unmute you. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes people mute me on purpose, so I get a little bit of a complex. But. Yeah, right. Um, so one of the first, there are some PM fundamentals though. So people do roll their eyes when they hear this information, but it's really important to just set yourself up for success. And so these are just some basic things that every single project needs to have. You need to put together a project charter, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Make sure you have a project plan that outlines what you're gonna do. The project plan doesn't have to be 50 pages. It might be 10. But this is something just to, there are lots of resources available to say, how do I set up a project plan? And it just kind of gives you a roadmap of how you're gonna to work together. The communication plan, the risk management, and the requirements are three that I've starred here. Because if you put nothing else in your project plan, these three things are the most important. How are you gonna communicate with each other and your vendor? How are you gonna identify and manage risks so they don't catch up and bite you at a bad time? and make sure you have really clear requirements. The other things, of course, data conversion, testing, and training are also critical. But those three will are the things Kathleen and I have seen that can really strengthen or weaken a project. The other thing right. that, oh, go ahead, Kathleen. I was just saying, the, the other thing is that the slide looks kind of ridiculous when you look at the idea that we're, the association has to do all this type of planning as well as the vendor. But this is the reality of what's necessary for a successful project. And I think that's kind of the key message we're trying to put with this visual. Mm -hmm. That the association will have a project charter where you say this is what we're gonna do and the vendor will have one because the vendor's goal is to finish the project on time, on budget. But they are not responsible for managing the association's project team. So that's why you're both, you, you may share some of these things like the project plan, you may share the, the core of it but then the association will have certain tasks within that, that plan that are not the responsibility of the vendor and vice versa. So that's why Kathleen and I said, everyone does all these tasks. Some of them will be shared. I'm gonna to click to the next so slide. So when we're talking about a, a, a project charter, uh, we just have a picture in here. Again, this is something, there are lots of templates available. We just wanna to touch on this quickly. But what the project charter helps you do is focus what you're doing. It's a one or two page summary where the project team is one of the first things the project team will do together. Again, depending on which vendor you choose, you may develop this charter with your vendor or one just with your staff. But it helps you define why are we doing this project? What are the real goals and objectives? How does this support our strategic plan? What kind of data are we going to use? Because like Barbara mentioned, you may have 
learning management, virtual event management, other systems that are going to feed into this. You may connect this system to um, a reporting tool or an analytics tool. You need to decide upfront how you're going to accept things from the vendor. So when they deliver things, what is your internal process going to be to sign off so you don't get stuck at that point. It's also really important. Everyone's good at divining what's in scope. At the very beginning of this implementation, you should be talking about what's out of scope so that you can keep that separate and keep an eye on things. And then just what are you expecting from the vendor? What are the deliverables you're going to receive? What are the resources, people, and money that are going to be part of this project? Budget is a really important thing to make sure you've got a high level budget identified. And then what are the key milestones? So when you fill this out, it just helps everybody organize their thoughts. This can also be shared with the senior team or other leadership who just want a summary of the project without reading the entire project plan. And another part of the basic kind of PM 101 is identifying your team, knowing who is going to be working on the project with you, you know, the specific names, what are their roles, and then what blockers does the individual have? For example, you might have somebody with a scheduling constraint or, you know, right now we're dealing with a lot of parents uh, who are working as well as juggling home life. And so maybe you've got somebody who's moving to a 30 hours a week schedule. Um, maybe you've got somebody who's going to be uh, on maternity leave at a certain period of time. So I think it's really important to understand who's doing what on the team, what their roles are, as well as what blockers they have. You know, Gretchen had brought up a really good point of sometimes you might have a team member who's basically been voluntold to participate in an implementation. And maybe they love the old system and they're like, I don't think we need a new one. I mean, being aware of that. Um, potential bias is important to uh, for basically for the health of the team and the health of the project. So this is just a very simple example of a form, but the point there is knowing who's involved in what way and what are they bringing to the table and what potential blockers are there. Click to the next one. The once we're identifying the um, team members and who's doing what and why, that kind of easily takes you to the whole concept of the RACI chart. Um, and we've got the definitions here for responsible, accountable, consulted, informed. We often add an S to it also, like a supporting. So thinking about what is important for you and this project. And there's tons of RACI charts out there on the internet and you can Google them. Um, the key thing here is again, knowing who's working on the project, what are their roles, and how are you gonna be working together? Um, on this next slide, We've got an example of one um, where we've identified, you know, the roles at the top. We've got different activities for the project on the left, and we've got the different responsibilities assigned, whether it's an R, A, C, or I, or like you said, you might add a, uh, an S in there. The key thing here is that there's only one person accountable for a task. So you only have one A assigned to each line. You could have multiple R's. Um, so that's something to be thinking about. And I will tell you, this is such a simple concept, but when you are in the process of creating a RACI chart, it can get really complicated. And that's okay. I think it's actually important to know that. And, you know, Delcor's president, Dave Coriel, he's always says, the discussion is what's important. It's not actually producing this really pretty colorful slide, but it's the fact that you're discussing who's involved in doing what, who is accountable. Who is responsible? Who just needs to be consulted? Who just needs to be informed? You know, is somebody supporting the effort? So that is really a critical part of um, working together and defining your team. Who's doing what? I'm going to click to the next slide. This is around team communications, and I think Gretchen is muted again. I don't know if we can unmute her. If not, I can take this slide. Here I am. Great. I don't know if this is a sign from the universe, but <laughs> <laughs> we're just glad to have you, Gretchen. That's it. So speaking of communication, you need to make sure your team can communicate with each other. Um, but you need to figure out what's the right channel. And so again, this is a, a just a simple chart to say, identify what type of communication you're going to have and who's going to use what tool. 
So for project management, the association may use something simple like Microsoft Planner or Excel. The vendor may use something more, a, a, a classic project management tool like Asana or Rike. The point here is the, the vendor will have their own internal project plan that won't necessarily be shared with the association staff, <clears throat> excuse me, because it has a lot of their internal tasks. But the association needs to have one too, <clears throat> because you're gonna have things like prepare for the next phase of the project, or you may have internal meetings where you need to make decisions. So it's important to, for you, even if it's very basic, to have the association's plan established somewhere that's not in email or chat. The second thing you need to figure out is where you're gonna store your key documents, both the association's documents that they just keep oh, separate from the vendor, like they might be creating test plans or standard operating procedures or different business decisions that they'll document, but those need to be stored in a place where everyone can get to them. The vendor may will have the same thing where they will have an internal location where they store a project files, but they may share a subset with, with the association. So you just need to figure out where those things will be available. Requirements, many vendors use JIRA. And if you learn that your vendor uses this tool, it's really important to get training on this tool because you will be assigned tasks. And so the staff will be working within the vendor's tool. So you may, it might be helpful sometimes for the staff to pull things out of JIRA, put them into Excel so you can manage your own tasks. It's just important to make sure you understand how those two things connect. The workspace is really important. As you can see, you're starting to build a lot of different um, things you're keeping track of, your project plans, your documents, your requirements. So you need to figure out where are we gonna centralize the access to those files, whether you use something like an intranet or SharePoint Online's workspace. Many vendors use a tool called Confluence or they may have a client dashboard where they just list all of these different assets and then links so that you don't get lost. And then one of the most helpful and potentially problematic thing is this chat. And so, especially now when, when everyone is more remote than they've ever been working, chat is such an important feature, but you also have to know how many chats you're gonna have going, who's gonna keep track of them. So Slack is really a popular uh, tool because you can invite staff members who don't work in the same place. So you can have people from your vendor team, other partners and the association team all in one conversation where something like Teams may only restrict you to have only internal conversation from the association side or the vendor side. So again, which tool you use isn't as important as defining how you're gonna use it. The other really important thing about chat is when people start putting decisions and requirements into a chat, the project manager or somebody on the team has to call that out and stop that behavior. So that's just the one thing to keep an eye on when people start chatting issues or problems, requirements, needs in a chat where they really should be in that requirements document or in another location. It's interesting when you think about, you know, kind of that PM 101 and everyone's like, oh, you need to, you know, plan for communications. And oftentimes you're like, well, what am I, you know, what do we need to be planning for? When Gretchen and I started thinking about what makes a successful project and with the clients that we've seen successful, what have they done? It's been thinking these things through and starting sooner than later. Um, and so that's why we kind of came up with these examples. And again, it just seems kind of the idea of do the association and vendor both having elements that bring the project together. And I, our, it's our goal just to kind of have you guys start thinking about it sooner than later also. Yeah. So that's, those are all the basic ground rules that you should follow with any project. Like Barbara said, you can use this for learning management or if you're you know, implementing a virtual event system. These are just the fundamentals that you should have with every single project. When it comes to AMS implementation, there, you know, like Kathleen, I said in the beginning, there's three big phases. There's discovery where you are defining your requirements with your vendor and you're establishing the scope of the project. Then you'll move into implementation where the system is actually being configured and refined. And then you'll move into the launch prep where you're doing that final training, testing, and just iterating through that process. 
Some vendors will use an agile methodology where you'll do all three things in a cycle. So you'll do some initial discovery for one area. Say you'll set up your membership join workflow. You'll do the discovery about that, the setup, the testing, and then you'll put that aside and you'll go back to the next piece of functionality. So whether you do this in an iterative way or one big sweep, uh, doesn't really matter. It just, you need to understand what the process looks like. All right, and this is takes us to treasures and trash. Yeah, so this is where uh, you start to see some hoarding behavior popping up or some purging. So you're either gonna have your Marie Kondos who, who say, get rid of everything we have. I can't stand all the baggage of our old system, so we're gonna leave it all behind. And then you're gonna have the people say, but we worked really hard on these SOPs and we have all this good stuff that we don't wanna lose. Before you start talking to your vendor about requirements, it's really helpful to assess the assets that you have and pick out the really good ones and start practicing getting rid of things. So if you have, um, you know, as, as Moira pointed out, a really good request for proposal and a selection document, that's something you want to keep because it started outlining those high level requirements that you're going to unpack during implementation. So that's a keep. If you have SOPs that are current, and useful that talk about the business rules of your of your current process, those are good to keep. If you have old SOPs or documentation that's out of date or it's very system specific and won't translate to a new product, get rid of it. Like re physically remove all of those files and put them in an archive folder so you're not even tempted to drag those out. If your organization has a really clear roadmap of initiatives and how they work together, those are really important documents to share with the core team and the vendor just to make sure you understand how the AMS fits into the rest of the business um, objectives. And then making sure your vendor partners are part of the conversation is a big treasure. So if you have higher logic or another community platform, event registration, so many organizations, no matter what size, have lots of different partners who all work together they need to be part of this project so you don't catch them off guard at the end of the project where you say, okay, I need to uh, hook up my new AMS to your system, so I need that done next week. That's really difficult for those vendor partners to react. So start now because you're gonna have to go through this mental process throughout the implementation of people holding on to their you know, favorite things when they really need to release them. And then other people who just wanna have a scorched earth brand new process. So just try to balance those two things. That's right. Gretchen and I do this all the time because I'm a pack rat and she's focused, <laughs> what do we need to do right now for this project? So, all right. So, on the so next slide. some requirements ideas we have, again, depending on the vendor, they're gonna have their own process to collect requirements. And this is the first place where people might feel a little bit uncomfortable because this will be new. So Kathleen and I just wanted to share some of the most common requirements gathering techniques so you can read about them a little bit, do some research. And then if your vendor told you the process they use to gather requirements as part of your proposal, it might be a good idea just to do a little reading to learn about how these different techniques um, are used in a project. But for any requirement, you need to be, make sure you can explain them to somebody. And that's sometimes good practice for the team to get together and just talk through, what are my processes? Can I even explain them clearly to another colleague within the organization? Are there um, expectations that you need to set for different members of the team? And then how are you gonna make sure that you're not trying to take what you wrote for your legacy system and just drop it into your new system? So that's where you need to talk about the process, but not all the buttons and steps you're clicking along. A user story is a way to pull out individual snippets of what you're doing. And so this helps put things into English. So you'll say, instead of the vendor saying, what do you wanna do And you just start rambling on? They may say, as a new member, I want to perform this action. Or as a non-member customer, I want to do this. So if you ask it in those kind of user story phrases, it really helps break down the essence of what you're trying to do. So one of the examples we're sharing is, as a customer, I want to register online. 
so that I can pay right away with my credit card. So that'll help the vendors understand, you know, you're not trying to create a really complicated shopping cart. You're just trying to get people to register and check out. Scenarios are another option where you say you create a persona, like I am a, a student member. And these are the types of things I want to do during a process. And you're telling a story. And sometimes that's easier for association staff to just tell their story about a particular case. And then the vendor may break that down into a series of user stories so that they can set individual tasks. So those are just some examples. I think there's over 20 different ways to gather requirements, but some of these are the most common. Yeah. You know, a very common question you might have would be like, Gretchen, why are you telling me about requirement ideas? I'm in the implementation. I've already picked my vendor. I created an RFI, an RFP. We went through the whole process and I'm in implementing. And I think that's kind of the reality that we wanted to bring to the table is that during the implementation and the discovery phase, whatever the vendor might call it, you are uh, focusing on your requirements so that they know how they are configuring or developing the system for you. So this is where the requirements come into play, but it's much more focused for this particular system. And Gretchen and I often challenge each other with the idea of a selection, you are developing requirements so that you can evaluate and identify the system and now you are focusing requirements for how the system needs to be set up and or configured. And it's a, it's a slight nuance there, but it's actually a really important one to think about, um, that you aren't just done with requirements, but you're obviously building on the requirements you have already developed, but then that's when a vendor might say, but we use user stories or we use scenarios. So it's really important to understand how the vendor you selected, the system you're implementing, what their process and how they are working so that you can communicate effectively with them. Yep. All right. All right. So review requirements. So whatever method the vendor uses, when you're explaining your requirements to your vendor, at the end of the day, you need to read them back and say, is this a reasonable requirement? Even though you might have done it, you're describing something that the association has done for many years. We see this over and over again, where you actually read it. You're like, wow, that is really complicated. That might be hard to do. If your brain says that, Last question. use that. You, need to, you, need to read. you also have to make sure you can test it. So if you've stated a requirement in whatever method you have, you need to be able to say, now how would I go through a system and make sure that this works? So frequently when you try to put the testable lens on a requirement, you may need to break that requirement up or refine it because it's just too big or too vague. And then is a requirement a yes, no, either the system either does it or doesn't do it, or is there some nuance that it will depend on, is it depending on if you're a student or retired member, you know, are there any nuances in there? And then I mentioned this earlier, is this something that anyone can understand is moving as much internal association language as possible is really helpful in this stage. Great. Thank you, Gretchen. This next slide, I love this uh, little graphic with the wave and you know, this is the, our point here is you need to get ahead of the data wave. You know, data conversion is one of the most critical aspects of a system implementation, unless you're starting from new, but most of the time organizations are bringing some type of data forward. Um, and the, it can be easy to think that it's going to be down the line, but the point is you need to be thinking about data from the get go. Um, the earlier you start thinking about it, the better, even during like a selection phase, it can't be hurting to think about what are, what is the data we want to take into a new system. And then at the start of the implementation, you and your vendor need to be talking about it to make sure that they know and you know what you do want to convert, what makes sense. Um, and it's not something you want to delay. And we, we think it's important that when you're starting with that planning to thinking about the data, of, is it really just bring, you know, I've talked about being a pack rat, pack rat, but is it important to bring everything forward? Probably not. And this is a great opportunity to be really focused. Um, we've got these three questions here that you need to ask. You know, what are you gonna do with the information when you have it? 
will be used to make decisions or being used for analysis? And then what's the best user experience? If we're collecting data, are we doing anything with it? What are we doing with it? Does it make sense to continue collecting it? Um, I feel like there's a, definitely a historical perspective because we could ask for questions or we could put a form on the web and ask people to do it. We were building all those things. But I think it's time to really think and be smart about it. We don't want to exhaust our users. Plus with understanding you know, the different data privacy, we really need to be focused with the type of data that we're collecting. So I think it's, we think it's really important to ask these questions and be smart about data conversion. And the other, you know, people are going to say, well, I need this because I don't know, I might have, might use it someday, or we may have a marketing campaign where we need to go pull data that's five or six years old. So we have to bring everything. Data storage is cheap. So why are you having me trim down our data stack? This is, this can cause you a lot of cost. Every record you convert needs to be reviewed. So that's staff time, vendor time. So that's a cost where the actual storage may be inexpensive. Your time to review it and make sure it's good quality is a resource that you're gonna to have to expend. And really, if you have anything over three years, we would challenge you to say, is that data still relevant, reliable, and useful today? So we want, Delcor usually recommends bringing over activities that are very lightweight, so you can kind of see trends over time but absolutely no financial transactions. Those are so difficult to move from one structure to another. So if you have to bring anything over three to five years max and just the lightest record possible to maintain the integrity of, of the member record. Absolutely. So we're the other thing you need to think about ahead of time with data is most organizations do have different systems that are integrated. Whether you're a very small organization, you may just have a very simple integration with your website or a basic community platform. But this is something in, the, in this discovery phase, you need to map out what data is moving between which system and what are those rules? Is it just gonna be authentication where your event registration system just needs to authenticate the customer from the AMS so that they can access the registration process and proceed with the right price? Or do you want to send data back to the AMS? So if they're registering or posting in a community, do you want to see that activity back in the AMS to build out their member record? But it's really important to draw this map so that you understand not only the data that's moving, but the resources you need to bring in to help set up that integration. So that, again, don't remember when I said in the beginning, don't forget about your partner vendors this is a really good opportunity to bring them in during discovery and connect them to your new AMS vendor to say, here's how the data was working in our old system. Here's the adjustments you want to make and give them time to start preparing that so that when it's time to test, everything's ready. Absolutely. So this is the spark joy slide, which right. I love. <laughs> <laughs> so again, my plug for purging information that you don't need and giving yourself a fresh start. Great. All right. Um, this next slide, we were talking about making change work for you. You know, we we're talking about the different aspects that occur during an implementation. You know, when the discovery is completed, you're getting into the actual implementation phase where you know, this vendor will be configuring based on all the requirements and solutions, um, designing, you know, we cannot emphasize enough that you should always be looking for opportunities to refine your process. Um, everyone's process is gonna be, every vendor's process is gonna be a little bit different. Um, you know, some vendors might go through the idea of these discovery meetings, and then you get to this phase, and then they're gonna have configuration meetings. You're like, well, wait a minute, what? But this is literally uh, where they're going to start configuring the system with you. And this is where you and your team might see how these solutions are being deployed. Um, and there can be some discomfort during this phase because people are like, oh, I didn't know it was going to look like that. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't think it was going to be this way. Um, we really want you to challenge yourself and your team to be open um, to look for 
some potential changes that could benefit your business as well as ensure that you're working with a system the way it was designed and that you don't immediately you know, pivot into well, we need to customize um, and go off into um, some custom configuration that can make things more expensive or difficult later on. Next slide. Um, related to the idea of you've moved into this phase where you're configuring, that can often be a time to re-examine uh, re your team. Um, you had a team in place for the discovery phase. Does the same team um, make sense for this implementation phase where they're designing and configuring and testing? You know, so we, we really want you to think about who's on there, what their roles are, and what they're doing. Do you need to add anybody, any subject matter experts to participate in system setup um, or to assist with testing? Um, you want to be very cognizant about these new phases and what does it mean for their workload. Um, if you're heading into a, a big testing phase and you want core team members to be reviewing or diving into testing with subject matter experts, you need to be very aware of what their other responsibilities are and workloads and see if you need to get any executive backup to free up their schedule. You know, we also say, you know, consider backup if possible. Maybe there's always that critical team member, um, but the idea should be having some type of cross training and backup should that person go out sick. You don't want to then throw the whole project out of alignment because of a timeline issue. So it's just time to think about it. Mm -hmm. Now this is about um, scope creep alert. Yes. Is so this is where in the beginning when you said to yourself, this is what's in and out of scope, it's good to have that pinned up somewhere where you can see it because when you start to see the system come together that's a big temptation like kathleen to say oh well let's add this this looks really cool or now that i see this new feature in the new system i would like to expand that and do more this is really important to just stay focused on getting this initial phase set up it might be worth noting these are some things we want to pursue after the core system is in place. That would be fine, but you need to make sure that you do not get distracted at this stage. Or if you find functionality that is really going to improve something that your association does, that's great. If you're adding something, make sure you know if this is going to add time or money to your project, or do you need to trade out other features that are coming up in the next phase? So that's what's, What's really uh, something you need to stay really focused. Kathleen and I are going to say a lot of during this presentation, but that's really one of the key elements. It's just keeping your eye on what is the core set of functionality we need to launch this system. And then what can we add in future phases to make sure that this, the system stays vibrant and relevant to staff and members. And as Kathleen said, you just need to continue to look for ways to simplify and adjust your processes. This is another irritation that is going to happen with people. If you see some of the ways vendors are asking you to change a process, some of them might not be amazing. You will have situations where your current legacy system might do something better in a single case than your new system. And so that's where you just really have to say, is it worth making the adjustment and adding one more step in the new system for the greater good? Or is this some uh, opportunity that, where you might have to do some advanced configuration or customization? So you're, we're not telling you to accept the entire process wholesale, but just be very selective about when you start pushing back with a vendor to say, I understand why you're asking me to do it this way, but this is such high volume, such high risk that we do need to make some modification. And then we also recommend that you keep an eye on the core, the members, contacts, finance, membership, and then whatever your major business driver are. Maybe it's events, maybe it's product sales, but just keep an eye on that core set as you're looking at the entire project as a whole. And if you do decide that you need to have a configuration that's very complicated or add some customization, that's, that's fine to do. Just be very selective about it and understand the short-term cost of what it will take for your vendor to do that for you. And then what's the ongoing cost to maintain that 
that additional change in upgrades and training, and then any potential conflicts with baseline in the future. The other thing sometimes we talk about is if there is something very complicated you're trying to do and it's not part of that base set of functionality, is it possible that that can go into a future phase and you can tackle it once you get to know the system and you become more of an expert in that system, you may make different decisions. So that's just something to keep in mind. Oh, did we lose? I think we might have lost Kathleen. Kathleen lost power. No problem. Oh. And I'm going to put the slides up for you here momentarily if you want to keep on going. Okay. Oh my heavens. Back up, back up. All right. <laughs> uh, what, remember Kath Kathleen inside? You, you need to have a buddy? Yep. <laughs> so let me know when the slides are back up, Fanu, and I'm on slide 20, uh, down in the make change work for you. Don't panic. And um, yes. Are we there? We are there. Awesome. That's so funny. <laughs> See, so we're not going to panic. We're going to keep going. This is what happens. Um, so when you get into the next phase, which is when you're really getting your hands on the system, you're doing the tech training, testing, more training, more testing, people start to get very anxious during this phase. Like Kathleen said earlier, you're gonna see things that are unfamiliar, you're gonna feel uncomfortable, you're gonna start feeling the pressure to launch. During this last phase when you're getting ready, this is the best time to just stay very calm, keep everyone focused on, we're just gonna work through these as we go, we may have to make some decisions, but just don't stop and start a worry conversation. Just say, we just got to move to the next step and the next step, and we're going to keep going. Can I, can I interrupt here with a question? Of course. I'm going to play the part of association IT expert, something I've never been. <laughs> but of the folks that I have known who are highly talented in many ways, some of this interpersonal behavior for calming down colleagues is not necessarily the strongest skill. Is this, <laughs> right. an area, is this an area where the consultant is able to help or you would rather stay behind the curtain? No, no, Barbara. I think this is where people like you and I help because when people are aggravated, sometimes even if you have a very talented IT professional who who has some soft skills, sometimes your team members don't want to hear it from a colleague. True. They'll say, just leave me alone. You don't understand what's happening and you're just being a pain. And so sometimes a consultant is neutral. The consultant is just here to make sure the project is successful and they don't mm -hmm. carry all of the history that you may have with other colleagues, good or bad. And that's where also consultants can reassure you and say, we've done this before. You're, here's what's going to happen next. It's also an opportunity if there is a really big problem, a consultant can help escalate for you and preserve the relationship with your vendor. That if you're really aggravated or worried, instead of getting into a really tense conversation with your vendor, the consultant can help negotiate that. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And this phase two slide, Barbara, is another way where consultants can really help when if vendors start putting everything in phase two, so this what's, is what happens when projects start running a little bit behind, everything goes into phase two. And you know darn well that there's no money, time, or interest in a phase two. So this is another really important conversation to have is if we're going to put things in a future phase, you better honor that or no one will ever trust you again and they will never drop anything. And so if you're going to put things into a parking lot or in a phase two, that's absolutely fine as long as you have a definitive time and budget to get that work done. So if you're putting things in phase two because it's a lower priority and you need to learn about the system more or you as the organization aren't really solid on your requirements, that's a perfect thing to put in phase two. You know, accreditation, certification, or a new program may benefit having that base in first and then revisit it. Which is but great just, terminology to use because I don't think we would ever tell a colleague that their project is low priority. <laughs> well, maybe but not. But that, that. that is how decisions <laughs> can get made. Right. Yeah. And then here's some, uh, the next two slides are just about some things that we've learned about testing. Uh, 
if a when a clients see that a vendor has testing in the project plan, they're like, all right, we don't have to test. I hate testing. Ah. Vendors are only going to test to make sure that the program doesn't have a big error message. They're not going to test it to see if the workflow for a new member or the workflow for a registration meets what the association expects because they don't know. They're not trying to say we don't test for that to be obstinate or difficult. They genuinely don't know and this is not their area of expertise. So you need to have a, a really clear testing plan where the association understands the vendor's going to test all these things. The vendors frequently have some standards that they follow to say we're going to test these 100 features so that the staff can follow along. And that really helps staff get acclimated to the system and maybe run through some of those base tests with their vendor and then add more difficult or more complex things. It's also really important when you're testing a system to test it on the, the most common normal path before you start adding every exception known to man and try to break the system. That is one of my pet peeves is when people start saying, well, I'm going to try to break the system on the first day because mm -hmm. you will. And then you're going to start to feel defeated and, and worry about the system. Start with the things that are the most common, the highest volume, the most important, make sure those work well. Then of course, test the exceptions, but understand that there are things that are still going to be manual or still going to be quirky. If you have very, very complicated um, processes in your organization. Well, and, and I'm going to, oh. during this, I'm going to put up a question that Michael has presented, okay. which is whoever has time to come up with and document all of those test scenarios. Say, say the first part of that again. Um, this is oh, fine. Who has time? Yes. Yeah. Who has time to, to come up with the test scenarios? I mean, is that, so this is something that also needs to be association driven, not just vendor driven, right? Right. You have to make time. Um, and that these are, this is one of the tasks that I suggest people do after you do the initial discovery, even if you're doing an agile process, the vendor's going to need some time to do their configuration. That's the perfect time for the staff to go back and say, let's write those test plans for the configuration that the vendor's working on. And so that you do them in little, little pieces. And it's also important when you're doing testing to break these sessions into small, like an hour, hour and a half, and then take a break. Uh, the other way to break these up is if you have one person who, even if you don't write them down, one person will take the, the membership application and say, okay, step one, do this. And then the person with their hands on the keyboard performs that piece. And you, then the first person says, okay, that looks good, check. Even if you're just taking your, your current work products and putting it through the system, if that's the way you're going to test, if you have two people doing it, that makes things go much faster. And I have seen that work well when it might be two people who don't normally work with one another. Mm -hmm. So they're coming at it from two different, they're not understanding what each other means. They're strictly going by what each other says. Yes. So that's another way to get around the writing formal documentation. Just take whatever the process is, whether it's an online form or, you know, a standard operating procedure or just someone verbally saying it, um, it's much easier to have two people. And I'm glad to and, see we have Kathleen back. Yes. Yeah, hey Kathleen. Do you have power, Kathleen? Or are you still in the dark? I have power. <laughs> okay. I've got power now. It just came back on. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll just let um, Barbara uh, keep driving for us. <laughs> so when we talk about, um, the other one is training. Um, I think we talked about this already. You're, you're just doing this throughout the process. And so if you can spread it out and make these small repeatable um, efforts, it's a lot easier than saying, we're going to have a week of testing and we're going to do it eight hours a day, five days a week. The more you can spread that out and do it throughout the project, the better. And as Barbara said, one of the best ways to, uh, learn is I learn it and then I teach it to Barbara. Barbara learns it, teaches it to Kathleen. 
And that's the other way your vendor can be your coach. If you say, I'm going to show you how I think it should be done. Mm -hmm. And then the vendor can watch you and they also can do some tweaking along the way and say, well, why are you, why are you using that confirmation? If you click right here, we have a shortcut. So that's the other way to use the vendor expertise and your expertise together. So the last section we're going to talk about is just pacing yourself. And like Barbara said, when people get aggravated and anxious, these are some of the things you should really keep an eye out. And so the project manager or the lead on the project needs to constantly be listening for signs of things are going great. We need to do more of that. Or I'm hearing some little signs of warning that you need to act on before they're an emergency. And frequently, this is where consultants have a very trained ear for this type of information because we do so much volume. Where an association may only have a large project every year, every other year. You know, Kathleen, Barbara, and our colleagues, we do this all the time. And so these patterns are very familiar to us. So when things are going well, um, you know, always expect the best, right? You want to have a self-fulfilling prophecy in the positive way. So you want us to hear things like when the staff is saying, hey, I found this really cool feature within the new system and I love it. I would have never thought to do it that way. That's a, that's a wonderful thing you want to hear. If you hear people saying, I'm feeling really overwhelmed. I've been in this project for you know weeks and weeks and I just need to do something else for a while to let my brain rest. And they're seeking that in advance. That's a good thing and listen for that. And again, that's if you have a buddy, you might need to tap out. If your team member without prompting says, you know what, I don't think this is the right time to talk about this right now. We need to talk about this when we're in the uh, the certification conversation or the event registration conversation. This is the wrong time. When your team members start to self-regulate and figure out how the pieces come together, you know that you have a very high performing team. And then when teams just help each other, if they say, you know, I can see that you know, Kathleen lost her power, so she's going to be out for the rest of the day, I'll pick that up for her. So those are the things that you need to listen for identify them and tell people, hey, wasn't that cool that, um, you know, Gretchen and Kathleen were working together, Kathleen lost power, Gretchen kept going, and we met our deadline. We need to keep doing things like that. Good job, everybody. And it sounds silly, but that's what human beings need. They need reinforcement for the positive things that are happening. So the not so positive things that you want to be listening for are shutting down. I can't do this, this is not working, negative words. Mm -hmm. If you have someone who's been a really solid team member and all of a sudden they're too quiet, too those are the people you need to immediately call privately and say, what's going on? Let's talk about this. If all of a sudden your happy team starts ripping the system apart and says, it doesn't do this and this and this and this and this and we made a big mistake. You need to stop and figure out what the root problem is and correct it. So, and like I said earlier, too loud or too quiet are both problems. And then if you constantly hear, well, this isn't what I thought the system would do. This is, we made a big mistake. I think in the 30 years that Delcor has been doing AMS selection, I think we've had two or three times out of 30 years where a client actually did make a mistake and needed to readjust their system. It is so rare. So you have to make sure that you figure out what those, the root problem is. And I'm sure Barbara, you've seen and seen that and had to coach people through this tough time. Oh no, never. <laughs> and I hate to coach through this, but we have like four minutes. All right. So I'm, I'm almost done. So then the, one of the most important things to prevent this is right. Open up the communication channels early. So you need to make sure that the CEOs are talking on a regular basis, the project managers, so that when you hear one of these problems, you already have an established relationship to, you know, nip that problem in the bud instead of having to tell this big backstory. And then you need to 
really prepare for the launch into adoption. And, and um, Rebecca A. Church will spend a lot of time talking about this. Plan a stabilization period of three to six months where you leave the system alone and you get used to it. Add training sit in during that stabilization period. Pay for that, budget for that, because that'll really help you use the system and keep it alive. And then just use some really good governance techniques when you're talking about your systems and your data to improve the health of the system so you don't go back into some bad habits. And that's it. So, you know, set up your plan, work your plan, keep it alive and adjusted, keep focused on your goals, make adjustments as you need to, and just pace yourself because everyone says it's a marathon, not a sprint. Are there any final questions? We had one earlier. I, I didn't interrupt at that time, but um, we had a question about how do you reconcile it when the vendor plan and the internal plan don't quite sync up in the beginning? How would you recommend tackling it? And would you tackle it then or wait until later? I would, I would sooner is always better. I know you never would wait until later, but. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Sometimes it does have to wait till later, honestly. Like if you try to make a project plan that's a year long, mm -hmm. you're going to make adjustments. So I also wouldn't sweat the small stuff either. So if your vendor is saying your testing window is going to be nine months from now on this week, I, okay, maybe. I'd I would just make on, sure yeah. that then, yeah, the, the next phase is tight and then just keep adjusting. Right. And actually, timeline is something we didn't really uh, talk specifically about. If I'm starting my implementation pro process, oh, let's say Monday, I'm going to be live by New Year's, right? Um, you can if you launch. I just with, didn't say uh, which year. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> or, you know, some people do have very tight launch windows, and that's okay if you set your scope and you make it a very tight process. Some people actually will launch a system with just customers, finance, membership, and publications or events. They'll say these are the most important things. Our current system is garbage. And you can do it pretty fast. Okay. That gets to the whole point of the planning, that upfront being on the same page with the vendor, you know, and then working together to the same cause, you know? And, and I've also, I want to go back to Marie Kendo because I love that you brought that in. Um, do you have any pointers you would share with staffers when you've got those data hoarders who just don't want to get rid of anything? Are there, are there multiple places where you would stash the old t-shirts and the ripped robes? Or how would you recommend getting rid of the data that should not travel into the new system? So I really love her method of thanking something and releasing it to the universe. I mean, it's like so hokey, but sometimes just identifying, thank you, Barbara, for working so hard for the last 10 years to make sure that our financial data was picture perfect. You have done an outstanding job. You picked you know the department what? that is the most hoarding, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> and we have all this information in our financial system, we also have backups of it on, on the network if we ever need it. So for the new system, we're gonna say goodbye. But we already have what we need. We've had, every year we have a clean audit. And sometimes you just have to explain to people why you don't need it anymore. And, and, and a lot of this is very personal because I built this process and it's personal mm -hmm. to me and I'm proud of it. That recognition and sometimes I say you have to swap out the old dirty blanket for a new one, but you have to wash it with the same laundry detergent so it smells good. So you can say, you know, the other membership process was 27 steps and it was perfectly beautiful, but the new one should be 10 so that you hit your membership um, join numbers. So again, Barbara, I think that's where consultants can help with some of that nuance and negotiation. I agree. And, and could, I, I know we're running over time, but I'm hoping some people can stick around a little bit. What is the one biggest red flag? Is there one as you begin an implementation project that um, you could look at with the staff eyes? What, what should they be anticipating as a red flag they might be able to Marie Kondo away? For when they're looking at the vendor or the project? 
the project? What could the they do? The one big like red flag is if you have someone on your team who's dug in to, I'm here and I don't want to be here, but I suppose. Like, I would rather live without that team member's expertise then have them on and be negative. I, there's something called an oxygen thief where they just suck all the air out of the room and those people need to go. Even if they're the, the, the most, you know, they have the most history, I don't care. If you're gonna have a negative person on your team, they need to be out. Yeah. That underlines the whole importance of change management. You know, mm -hmm. you need to have everyone on board, supporting the goal, understanding why we're doing this, what we're trying to achieve, get on board or get off. Right. And the other thing I would say is the most important thing, Barbara, is if your finance team has said in the proposal, the project is going to be uh, $200,000, $25.15, <laughs> and that's your budget. I will never recommend putting in the proposed amount as your fixed budget. It's a range. And I think every single project needs to have at least 20% overage in your super secret stash that you don't tell the vendor, you just have it. And you also add a 20% over under to your finance team. Again, hold the vendor accountable for their proposal, but they proposed on a guess, a very educated guess but you have to give them some slack too, that they did their best, but they, they need an over under as well. Okay. And what recommendations do you make during implementation that help associations transition to having a vendor help for post launch? I know some of this is what we'll cover with Rebecca, but some of this comes under the actual implementation phase. I think it's really important to understand the handoff between implementation and support. So, that is something where you, we've seen a lot of stress where you have a high performing team and people love their vendor implementation team and they work together every day. And then they move into support and they're strangers who are asking rudimentary questions when you call for help mm -hmm. and that will chill a project. So many vendors are doing a much better job including the support team in that training testing window to get to know the client and kind of warm that team up so they're not having a hard stop between the implementation team and the support team. Got to keep that momentum. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I would also plan regular training for the next six or eight months, even if it's an hour lunch and learn spot training, uh, or if there's a user group meeting, just keep that the core team engaged in learning for the duration of the project. Well, and I also think it was during some AWTC events that I've heard some great training sessions described where you make it a contest for staff mm -hmm. during implementation, you know, have, um, how come I can't come up with the words? Less, less tests and ways well, that's one of my favorite things that we didn't have time to squeeze in here is you celebrate every single victory. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you wait and have a cake at the end of the project and go, yay, everybody have a piece of cake. I like to, at every time you have a major transition, I like to recognize people and say, we just had discovery and, you know, Kathleen was so quiet in the corner. And then during this one phase, she stepped up and came up with some amazing ideas that we had never thought of before. Thank you. And I would publicly say thank you. And I would probably send her some type of gift. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important to figure out what is the language of the staff member? Do they like recognition? Do they like physical rewards, like a day off? Do they like money? Um, I think that's something that it's not necessarily bribery. It's just recognizing the mm -hmm. effort that you're putting in and aligning the reward with what people like. And that's something only staff can do because I have had staffers chide me when I recognize them publicly because they didn't like that. Yeah. You know, they just, but, they just you wanted to. So, you but know, that that's might be an invisible. Can do. Yeah, that's yeah. something invisible that in that racy chart that Kathleen was talking about. You know, you might want to add a column for how do you like to be recognized, mm. and just mm -hmm. ask people, what, how do you want to be recognized? Because I'm going to do it. And so, <laughs> do you want me to do it publicly? Do you want, uh, you know, time or a gift card? I mean, I think if you ask people, they're like, oh, you know what? I really, I really am very shy and I don't like being recognized or other people mm -hmm. are like, I want my name in lights. And so the more often you tell people how wonderful I am, that's what I like. 
-hmm. And how is all this adjusted for being 100% remote? Are people I, still I going do the same through thing. This? Yeah. Just I think being one, well, I think being 100% remote, that whole communication is the key and breaking things up into even smaller increments. I think when you're doing these marathon um, requirement sessions or testing sessions and you can lock yourself in a conference room, it's fine because you have natural movement and breaks and you can read people's body language. If you're doing it virtually, you need to have nothing more than an hour and a half without a 20 minute break, period. Good advice. Well, are there any final words of wisdom you'd like to leave us with? Uh, there are many, but I, I think we've covered them all. I thought, I think, I really appreciate Barbara that you broke this into three pieces instead of trying to jam all of them into one. I think that's the other, you know, you've kind of demonstrate that, right? Break down the thing that you're in, cover it thoroughly, and then move on to the next piece. But I do want to acknowledge that you and Kathleen did an amazing job condensing a huge body of work <laughs> and I can't not give a plug for why we're taking next week off which is AMS Fest and I have a feeling if folks really want to hear a little bit more in depth they know where they can find that out yes 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 AMS so, Fest I'm doing a three-hour boot camp that first day I think it's Wednesday um, and we're going to go into excruciating detail about the whole um, selection process just so people are educated shoppers during AMS Fest Wonderful. So we invite everyone to join us two weeks from today for the third segment of our roadmap when Rebecca A. Church leads us through life after launch on August 5th. And just to let folks know, this has been so much fun and so helpful that we are probably going to add some more miles on our roadmap starting in either late August or September. So keep your eyes peeled for additional sessions coming. And pop me a note if you have things that you want added to our roadmap, areas that you want explored. We know lots of great folks who can share lots of great information. So thank you all. We will see you all in two weeks. Have a wonderful day. And I hope you keep your power on, Kathleen. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Thanks, guys. And Thank it's just a little bit of housekeeping before everyone leaves. Thank so you. Sorry. For <laughs> Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. This has been an A Plusify webinar. We're happy to bring these educational webinars to everyone. Uh, we do have a series, lots of webinars coming up, ranging from your roadmap um, to your AMS to different topics that you may be struggling with with your AMS. So definitely check our website aplusify.com slash webinars for more information. Uh, we'll make sure that you get a copy of this recording and the slides. And if you have any questions or need help getting in touch with the speakers, we're happy to do that for you. Again, thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Yeah.